Thank you. Which would be my voice? Yep. Yep. Okay. Uh, can you talk a bit and see whether I can see on my check, check, one, yep. two, three. All good. All cool. Good. Okay. Let's start. Um, so this is the last part of the tutorial. Uh we have uh Jing Hui Liu uh is who is a postdoctoral uh, research fellow at the Australian eHealth uh research center common uh CSRO. Oh CSIRO. Yeah. Such a long sorry, name. sorry for that. Um he is interested in studying and applying natural language processing and machine learning techniques to healthcare data and how they can contribute to realizing the potential of digital health. Uh, he recently obtained his PhD degree uh, from the University of Melbourne. Um, with that, I'll leave it to Jimmy. Uh, Thanks for that introduction, Jaihan. And uh, this part, I'll talk about language models, large language model for clinical texts. And uh, so this kind of... Uh, uh, we narrow down to this specific deep learning based method, uh, but at the same time, because of this uh, ways of uh, diff different ways of applying it in different scenarios, there's kind of a, also a broader coverage in, in a sense of, about uh, how language models can be used in the clinical context. And to start with, uh, uh, we want to first define the scope of what we mean by language uh, or large language models. So typically nowadays, LLM tend to refer to the transformer-based decoder model that are uh, models that are autoregressive, which means they take the context on the left to predict something on the right. Uh, however, in this talk, we call it a, consider a broader range of uh, language models, both encoder, decoders, and also encoder decoders. And uh, also the word large can be tricky to define and they can be ranged from several hundred million or several hundred billion. We, we sort of try to uh, step back, set, set step that kind of way to define these things. Instead, we try to approach uh, this LM in clinical context by considering, mainly considering their applications. And um, so the out, outline of this part include uh, seven sections, we talk about the encoder-based uh, language models and how what kind of application they can offer in a clinical context. Then we call about, uh, talk about decoder models, about the few shot, zero shot learnings, and some of the recent uh, question answering capabilities emerging from these LLMs, especially like, like the GPT-based models. And then on the third section, we talk about in, in light of these LLMs in the general domain trained using trillions of tokens is domain specific language models still necessary. And the fourth uh, section, we touch a little bit on evaluation. And then quickly we talk about some other extensions on multimodal modeling, uh, retrieval augmented uh, generation. And finally talking about some implementation concerns specific to language models. So encoder based models. So uh, Valada has uh, introduced uh, and showed us some results with BERT already. So this uh, specific uh, transformer-based uh, architecture, BERT was proposed in late 28, uh, 2018 and uh, it has been everywhere. And in this talk, we're, we're sort of uh, taking transformer architecture and uh, the multi-head self-attention grant as, as granted. So we don't dive into those details, but more focusing on the, the general uh, applications of different variations. And then people quickly realize these birds uh, should be, uh, can be and should be adapted to the specific doma domain. And uh, as introduced earlier on this bio birds and clinical birds, uh, people just continue to pre training these bird models that are uh, used to be trained on say uh, Wikipedia, but now they try to find some biomedical and clinical texts and pre-train these birds. And this ne necessity of domain adaptation has actually been well studied uh, in this uh, 2020, in this ACL uh, 2020 best, actually the best paper at, at, at that conference that year uh, from UDAP, that uh, this kind of continued pre-training for birds is essential for improved performance uh, for in-domain applications. And uh, it turns out these birds can be pretty flexible after portraying on the large corpus of texts. And uh, you basically just using the whole big body of the birds and just change the top layers. And you can fine tune it for a variety of clinical NLP tasks, including the information extraction, uh, some other text classification tasks, and also extractive uh, question answering, which means you try to uh, identify the specific answers from the paragraph, from the context, 
uh, given that you have the documents, uh, which is in contrast with uh, open domain question answering, which we're going to talk about later. And the benefits of pre-trained language models due to transfer learning and the way that uh, they do a lot of pre-training and other uh, uh, pre-training objectives to inject uh, uh, medical knowledge and make them achieve much better performance on many uh, clinical NLP benchmark tasks, including some of the, uh, like the eye uh, information extraction and other tasks uh, we, we touched about. However, just a caveat that uh, this bird is not always performing the best uh, for clinical texts, especially when the clinical documents sometimes can be really long, can be some, some documents can be more than 10,000 words long. And in those regards, we need some tricky methods to break it into chunks, or we have other, like say, say uh, more kind of LSTM based or CNN based model that actually performs better than BERT. But in general, these birds show really good performances, and there were studies to uh, to investigate how do we push this further to get get better encoders for these clinical text. And there's a there's a notion of between a domain adaptation from a pre-training from uh, uh, existed uh, existed uh, checkpoints versus pre-training from scratch. So what we talked about is that so we take a what we already covered is about we take a bird train pre train from general text, then we continue pre training on clinical notes. This kind of uh, is called the adapt domain adaptive pre training. But it actually, it uh, so this way is, is make things much easier and computationally manageable because pre training on large corpora of uh, text can be really expensive. Um, only a few uh, hands of uh, only a handful of uh, companies that are able to do that. But it turns out that the pre-training from scratch only actually works uh, much better than uh, this continual pre-training. And uh, so this work um, they called the, the bioclinical uh, clinical Roberta from the full, uh, Facebook, now Meta, uh, since they have a lot of computation, they, they do that, I try to pre-train them from scratch and they show that they can perform much better than just adapting an existing model from general domain. And the, this, the, the two key points that they show that is that the in-domain vocabulary matters a lot, uh, or the tokenization is really important for, for handling this messy clinical text. And also choosing the right pre-training corpora is also important. And so that's kind of oh, the way of, of applying this bird to the standard or typical NLP task. And, uh, however, there's another line of work that try to apply this this kind of NLP models at the point of care. And in this way, the perspective is to conduct, uh, to leverage these clinical nodes to perform clinical predictive analysis. And this kind of analysis is really important for medical uh, medical care and is kind of a, 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 a represent, capture a, a, a huge line of work in the medical literature. Uh, for example, developing a, a expert scoring system to assess the mortality risk of a patient, or many uh, and many other machine learning based model try to say predict the the kind of the the, the discharge time of the patients or the future mortality rate of the patients. So um, th so this line of work try to leverage clinical notes as a source for the clinical uh, predictive analysis, and uh, it sort of try to avoid some of the difficulties using the structure data that has been traditionally used for developing these kind of models. And uh, this is a recent work published in the in middle of this year uh, from uh, New York University within their own health healthcare systems. So they pretty much just pre-trained BERT using their all the nodes within a hospital system they can get hands on and then fine tune it on various clinical prediction tasks including hospital mortality, length of hospital stay, comorbidity, uh, insurance denial, prediction. Uh, so those are uh, analyzed in a retrospective manner. And then the prospectively, they also analyze, focus on the 30-day uh, hospital readmission test. Uh, so that is a specific, uh, specifically important one in the context of US because that is penalizable by Medicare. So because 30 day reanimation is considered considered a bad outcome and can lead to many adverse uh, results with patients and additional healthcare costs. 
And uh, so specific to this uh, uh, study, they show better results with uh, on these retrospective tasks and compared to their traditional and many popular scoring system based on structured data and many other uh, text-based model with their, the pre-trained part. And also the um, uh, readmission, readmission performance in this uh, prospective analysis is also shown to be quite competitive compared to human experts. And uh, the model can actually pick up uh, about 27% uh, of preventable uh, uh, readmissions, which means the clinicians, when, when this kind of model send the uh, email alerts to the uh, uh, clinicians, they can look at this 27% of patients, then do some intervention, maybe have a follow-up call or maybe pay a in-home visit to prevent this readmission from happening. And to put it into the context, uh, for the NL, NYU Alangu Health System, that means they could uh, potentially prevent 15 patients per quarter from returning to their uh, healthcare systems. That means uh, on average, they would, for these, each of these patients, they will be like a, a six times less likely to die and uh, much reduced uh, length of stay and about like 15,000 US dollars uh, cost uh, reduction uh, saved for these patients, for per these patients. So that's about some of the applications of how encoders can be used. Then the recent popular uh, stuff with uh, large language models, they're predominantly based on decoder. And uh, so, this is found by the GPT-3 paper that these kind of large between the model can be zero shot or few shot learners, uh, by which it means that uh, it does not need to consume a lot of labels to perform uh, certain tasks. And um, so in this case, we don't need to train this model anymore. We just keep it frozen, keep it fixed. We just prompt the language model will give a certain prompt to ask to do something and generate the output, um, which, whichever it is. And the strength of prompting this kind of large language model is compared to the fine tuning model, uh, models is that uh, these models tend to have general capabilities, they're more flexible to answer questions and uh, no or little supervision is needed. And uh, so theoretically, theoretically, they can reduce the labeling efforts and also enable new applications such as open domain question answering. So here's a study about uh, few shot clinical uh, information extraction using this uh, large language model, solely use prompting and no label or very few labels are used. So they pretty much just give it inputs and in the zero shot prompts, you just directly ask it to extract certain information that you're looking for. And in the few shot example, in this case, the one shot example, you give it some gu guidance or sort of a demonstration. Uh, a, a pair of input and the uh, expected uh, output, and then they give a new input and ask it to generate the, the labels that, you, that you're looking for. And it turns out that this prompting of GPT-3 shows similar or better results uh, in the zero shot setting compared to fine-tuning bird. And then in zero shot setting for fine-tuning bird, it means that the bird, for example, we're trying to do NER, and this bird has been fine-tuned using other NER data sets and uh, was transferred, directly applied to this small set of uh, clinical samples that has also examined with GPT-3. So this kind of the, is the kind of their setup to show that there's a lot of promise with prompting these uh, LLMs. Well, however, the tricky thing, there's a one tricky thing is that the, the output from the LLMs can be really messy. It does not always contain, uh, like, a, like presenting the output, uh, the information in a very neat way. And the, a lot of post-processing is required. And they actually show that uh, the, the, uh, like, uh, the better the post-processing you do, you can actually get a batch better results. However, that post processing is pretty much manual. So you have to still do a lot of manual work to examine it and develop these kind of uh, techniques to, to sort of process the output. And of course, there are other uh, uh, alternatives uh, for LLM uh, uh, in addition to GPT, there are FLAN T5 and some other kind of uh, uh, models. And 
and uh, also the better prompting techniques could also improve the results, like chain of thought prompting and other techniques. I recently, this work published directly uh, applied to clinical information extraction. They call it self verification. They can have a like on top of the typical extraction, it ask the LM to check for omission, check for evidence, and try to prune the, the output to make it uh, neater. And it is achieved by simply just changing the prompts templates. For example, for the checking the evidence, you prompt uh, the language model to tell it that you are an expert disease inspector, and now your job is to blah, blah, blah. And this kind of a setup also can improve the results. And uh, with this a certain different kind of tweaks with the prompts, it can also help provide a certain level of interpretability, though is uh, this is a hot topic and it can be controversial. And besides this kind of standard NLP tests, there's a lot of interest to apply GPT for open, uh, for open domain medical question answering. And so there were lots of studies to 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 um, try to measure the capabilities of these like chat GPT and GPT-4 and how they perform on, on answering like specific uh, patient queries or, or queries from clinicians. And uh, here's a paper published by Microsoft um, on the one uh, NEJM, the top medical journal uh, about uh, the suggested application of uh, GPT-4 for, for, the med for medicine. They talk, mentioned about medical note taking, explain uh, medical problems and do medical consultation. However, there's, they also acknowledge the risks of like, to what extent do we, uh, one can trust GPT and uh, also there's a lot of uh, efforts need to be put into there to spend time to verifying whether a, a, a claim from the GBT is true or not. And um, so it's a lot of work down there. But anyway, it, it definitely sparks a uh, lot of the interest to uh, to measure how much knowledge uh, does GBT have uh, for, for this kind of med for medicine in general. And the one way to measure that is to, to ask to sit at an exam and uh, that's what uh, people have done. And this is a study from Google and uh, they have their flan palm uh, uh, LIM and they pretty much just apply it, ask it to, to, uh, to answer the questions from the United States Medical Licensing Examinations or US LNE. And it turns out that um, uh, their, this palm model from Google can pass achieving a passing score, which is over 60. So in the middle of uh, the, the, the figure uh, for for this uh, licensing exams. And uh, which is, uh, I mean, a quite surprising results uh, because uh, about the, 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 the pace that, uh, how, how fast the pace these models has been developed. And there are also uh, like a following works on that. But here is just an example of the question being asked. Uh, so for example, it is a snippet or vignette of a patient condition talking about, uh, for example, uh, uh, a patient, a male, a male patient with hypertension and certain conditions. And they ask about what is the a likely cause of, uh, of the physical examinations or some other diagnosis. And they give a multiple choice and ask the model to pick which is the correct answer. So pretty much this is the exams and the, the, the palm model, GPT model uh, is, uh, uh, is able to achieve a pretty good score. Well, however, uh, there's a case that uh, in this paper is that uh, these prompts and demonstrations need to be designed by physicians. So the way you frame the palm prompts, you, the way you try to ask the queries can sometimes matter a lot for these LLMs to get the correct answers. So this kind of becoming a kind of a secret sauce in some of these works. But later uh, this this year, GPT, uh, Microsoft, and OpenAI also did the work to measure uh, the uh, to also put GPT four into uh, into this uh, UMS exam. And here, the GPT four is text only; it does not include vision. And we we will take a peek on that later. And in this paper, this sort of show that uh, the random exemplar selection, which means we choose different kind of demonstrations when doing future learning, 
that doesn't make much sense uh, compared to expert curation, curated examples. So there's a controversy, a controversial there. There's a conflict between different findings from different groups, and it's still an open research question. But in any case, uh, GPT-4 achieved um, even better results on, on this kind of US LNE uh, exams, and uh, even getting close to like a, a 90% if you're just giving a, a few examples. And even without example, it can achieve like a, over 80% of the accuracy. So that's uh, about the decoder models uh, uh, in, a, in a nutshell. And in this case, we see that so these general LMs can be really powerful. Then the question is, do we still need in-domain clinical uh, language models? And uh, so we focus on this recent paper uh, from researchers from MIT and Harvard and other places. They, they try to investigate this uh, question to compare small fine-tuned uh, task-specific uh, clinical language models with a prompting frozen large in general domain language models. And the takeaway is that uh, smaller models are still really performant in many of the tasks. So the horizontal line here, the two lines are prompting the two uh, popular LLM, GPT-3 and Flight, uh, Flight T5. And it, it turns out that when you have uh, enough uh, labels, uh, fine tuning these smaller, much, much smaller, uh, but domain specific uh, language model like BERT, can perform really well in these tasks. So, and uh, another thing is that uh, uh, even though its future seems, seems appealing, but uh, actually uh, for the decoder model, you sort of, you have to do future because it's difficult to add more demonstrations to the to the encoder context. And, uh, and uh, furthermore, uh, adding more demonstrations in, in prompting doesn't necessarily increase its uh, performance which is still open to research, but in here people tend to limit the demonstration, the number of demonstrations uh, like lower than 10. And um, so this pretty much shows that uh, 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 on these kind of standard NLP tests, uh, these uh, uh, like a fine tuned model are still very important. So just a summary of the pros and cons. So fine tuning works better with sufficient labels. However, this also comes with fine tuning smaller models because we all know that labels can be costly to obtain and tasks need to be well-defined. This model, you, you pretty much have per model, per task, per specific data sets. And uh, on the other hand, prompting uh, enable few shot or zero shot learning and uh, many other uh, new applications. Uh, but uh, accessing LLM in a clinical context can be a tricky issue. So the former works we see, they only examine a small set of samples that are that are sort of, they are allowed to upload that to the OpenAI server. But in many cases, the hospital are not allowed to have the data leave, uh, leave their systems. And also, we all know that uh, LLM can have issues with hallucination. And this is also other issues like uh, how to calibrate the output. And uh, also the prompt and demonstration need to be curated in many cases. This LM can be pretty fragile. If you just tweak certain words, you can, you can just sort it off in some cases, uh, though the reinforcement can, can, can alleviate that, but in many cases, that's still an issue. And also a lot of nowadays works try to select the best prompts and evaluate the performance. Uh, which kind of uh, is a kind of a data leakage. And uh, so this are actually a, a kind of a work called for true future learning uh, from, from uh, in, by, by people working in the general domain, but also applies to clinical domain. So there's also a evaluation kind of uh, 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 issues there. And however, we can also take a step forward to combine the best of the, best of the both world uh, by, uh, adapting a general domain LMs to the specific clinical domain. And, um, and uh, this is also has been stud studied in the Google paper that we saw earlier. So they adapt the flame palm to this called med palm uh, with parameter efficient fine tuning, which means you don't fine tune the whole model, which is too costly to just fine tune a fraction of the parameters. And it turns out it can make a much, uh, it can make a big difference. So the green bar is the med palm and the orange bar is their general domain 
uh, uh, decoder model and it is, it's, uh, shows much better performances. But furthermore, this kind of pre adapting to the domain specific, specific data is also critical to reduce risks and biases. So these three rubrics are extent of a possible harm, likelihood of possible harm and possibility of bias. So it shows that uh, adapting these kind of specific domains, the medical domain data is also very important uh, to consider this kind of evaluation aspects. And the mentioning about evaluation, we will shift the gear to talk about a little bit the, the tricky issues about evaluating language models and large language models in the clinical, clinical domain. Because the, in this case, there are much evaluations can be done uh, beyond accuracy. So first of all, there are some, there's uh, existing evaluation benchmarks for clinical NLP data sets. And uh, so we're the standard for, for NER, for RE, and uh, they're formatted in the standard. I mean, by standard, I mean, uh, I mean the, they are formatted in the standard, uh, like NLP uh, data sets formats. And also there's hospital level data sets and there are standardized uh, medical QA, like the UL, uh, US LLE exams we saw earlier. Uh, but there are many issues with existing, existing benchmarks, uh, such they could, uh, contain human artifacts. There could be labeling errors. They could be, uh, like say, different annotators have different opinions about how to label certain stuffs, and they could be data leakage, uh, especially with LLMs. It trains with so much data, we don't know what data it has seen or not. And also, there's a tricky thing is that uh, the performance of these standard NLP data doesn't necessarily translate to impact or patient outcome or Cost saving in the in a hospital in a hospital setting or in a real world setting, and also these kind of data sets uh, that the model trained with these data sets can be vulnerable to uh, the distrib uh, distribution shifts or data shifts, uh, which we'll talk a little bit more later. And uh, a lot of another thing is that uh, a lot of studies nowadays, like the like the GPT papers, they they tend uh, GPT four on on Q and A papers. They tend to do a lot of human evaluation, but that is not quite sustainable. Only a handful of uh, companies or healthcare systems are able, able to do that uh, because of the sheer cost of having physicians sitting at the in front of the laptop to going through these different answers and compare systems. So this is a lot of tricky things with uh, the current evaluation. And furthermore, there's also a issue with inconsistency of how people set up the evaluation. So take the, the medical licensing exam as an example. We see at least two papers, from one from Google, one from OpenAI. They all focus on US uh, LNE exams. However, these kind of exams have different levels, have different types, have different formats. And they all, the, 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 the studies are currently on these exams tend to focus on different, they tend to slice and dice this, these questions. And uh, they sort of, uh, in, in a nutshell, they are not really uh, using a kind of uh, the same test sets so that the model can be compared consistently. Uh, so that is another, also another issue here. And um, so even though you, you, it sounds nice that they all passed the uh, US LIE exam, but we don't know actually, uh, not yet like how do they compare against each other. And there's also many other uh, evaluation considerations beyond just predictive accuracy. So this uh, nice paper from Stanford talking about the uh, other aspects uh, such as the, 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 the reduction of labeling efforts, the easiness of deployment and the emerging uh, clinical applications, multimodality and the uh, uh, human AI interfaces. Those are critical for uh, uh, truly translating a uh, clinical NLP tool into a real world setting that can impact uh, clinical care. And, um, and also there's the generalizability issues. How do we validate the internal sort of effectiveness and how do we generalize to different uh, temporal or uh, uh, geographical data sets? For example, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, this in the data shift, uh, data sets shift uh, section. And furthermore, the deployment is really difficult for evaluation because in the clinical scenario, 
considering the workflow is critical, but uh, implementing an AI model in the healthcare is never free, even though you can give it as a free model, but it's the opportunity uh, uh, cost is really high. And uh, there's also many other considerations of implementing this tool. So there's a kind of a, a new evaluation pathways needed and just a shout out uh, for the digital health validity run happening here at the center of digital transformation of health. And uh, you can, if you're interested, you can find a lot of uh, for more information. And now we sort of gonna uh, uh, shift gear and uh, briefly talk about some extensions about of LMs and how they can be combined with other uh, sort of techniques in solving uh, clinical, uh, clinical NLP tasks or clinical tasks in general. So one thing about clinical care is that it's essentially multimodal. There are many other data elements out there besides the nodes, as Mike uh, introduced. There are lots of structured data, and uh, there are structured measurement, vital signs, for example, the your heart rates, your blood pressure, lots of lab values like uh, microbiology re uh, results, and uh, other uh, uh, these kind of measurements. And of course, there's nodes and the metadata. There are also like a small chunks of nodes that's kind of spread every, sort of everywhere in the electronic health records that are not, uh, cannot be easily gathered. And of course, there's the images, uh, radiograph, RMI, um, uh, ultrasound. And, uh, and there are many other data elements in the hospital, like uh, electrograph, like ECG, EEG. And if you think, take, even take a step, a step back, think about the the the, the health as a, as a whole. Uh, there are many other data elements that that so we could push, potentially consider, like social economic status, social media data, environmental data, animal data. So these things can be can be endless if you try to expand the list. Uh, but even though in the uh, clinical setting alone, uh, there are many different sources of data and they are presented in different modes um, and um, and uh, they can be leveraged in and they can be leveraged in different ways. And th there's a lot of interest in combining or or doing different things with these multimodal uh, modeling with uh, especially leveraging clinical IMs with uh, this is because the, the the power of deep learning to, can inject, adjust the architecture, inject the different inductive biases, and just train it. And uh, it brings a lot of potential to investigate different ways to how to uh, contrast different data or combine different pieces of data. So we're going to talk about three aspects of uh, multimodal modeling with language models uh, for clinical applications. One is fusion of multiple data sources or combining multiple data sources. Then we talk about learning the representations of different modalities, sort of try to project in, into their shared uh, representation space so that they can be translated from one to each other, uh, to one to another. And then we talk about multimodal few shots, which is kind of an extension to the, like the decoder model we saw and to, to try to use less labels, uh, but uh, in a way that they consider other data modalities. So for the multimodal fusion of clinical data, uh, the, the, the goal is to combine different modalities of data for joint modeling targets. So here is an example of a study that consider tabular data, including say patient demographics, time series, such as laboratory procedures, other vital signs, and the natural language that's from the clinical notes and the medical images, X-ray, uh, CT scan, the, the, they're they're kind of the same, but and and, and in here we see that uh, the typical way of uh, uh, representing the natural language of in the clinical nodes is to have a language model to extract features or to encode the clinical nodes. So in this specific work, they basically just use BERT to encode the nodes to find a representation. Though so later on, they can be used as a feature to combine with other features extracted from other data modalities. For example, you can have a ResNet to extract features from the medical images and then try to combine them. And then at the end of the day, 
you combine all these features together and try to predict a uh, kind of a patient uh, outcome or specific procedure or kind of uh, any targets that uh, that can be that makes sense. Uh, for example, in patient in hospital mortality. And uh, so it, it seems pretty straightforward, but sometimes they can be trickier than it appears, especially uh, consider the heterogeneity of different data sources. Uh, the, the, the end goal you want uh, one plus one is larger than two, but sometimes uh, if you uh, don't have a good enough architecture of adding extra data modality can actually dampen the results. So there were also some research try to find what is the representation that is modality specific, what is modality invariant, and how to kind of tame these heterogeneities uh, in the clinical domain. And uh, there's also works try to learn uh, image and text representations in the joint space so that can they can be translated from each other. And uh, so the, the most representative of works in this line of research is report generation. You have x-ray and uh, the radiology read it, try to read report, write reports. And a lot of studies try to do that automatically with language models. And uh, since so in that case, you kind of encode uh, the image into a representation and uh, in, use that representation uh, to serve it to an LM and let it to generate uh, based on that information from the image. So in that case, it's essential to have uh, the language model and the, and the image encoder to have the same semantic space that they, they sort of, in a way they can understand each other. And also they could be other, they can be other uh, applications. If we have these shared representations from image and text, uh, for example, we can retrieve uh, images based on the report or vice versa and so on and so forth. And, uh, um, and the, the, the one good thing with the clinical data, EHR data is especially with the radiology reports is, is, is it provides a really nice pair of this kind of image and text and uh, like a radiograph and radiology reports. So this becomes a really nice source to develop this kind of uh, a study, not only for just for a clinical domain, but also for a general domain. So this specific study, uh, this picture down here is from the paper from Stanford. Uh, this it was it was initially published in 2020, they called Convert. They basically try to do contrast learning, con contrastive learning over image representation and text representation. And they have some tricks to do that. And, uh, but I, actually the, the central idea is pretty uh, expressive. It is pretty simple. You want uh, the, the, the reports and the, the checks x-ray images, the, you want their representation to be close to each other if they're about the same patients, about the same diagnosis, and be far away from each other if from, from the different patients or different diagnosis. And actually this kind of idea ha was picked up by researchers at OpenAI. They scaled it up to the uh, in a general domain and uh, uh, and actually, that's the CLIP model, if you have heard of it, uh, that leads to DALI and uh, many other uh, multimodal uh, gen in the general domain. So I, I, so I guess it's kind of a, a nice example to, to show that uh, this kind of domain-specific research can sometimes also be really helpful for the in-general domain. And then finally, we, we're going to talk about this multimodal few-shot or zero-shot learning. So this kind of uh, enable us to do medical question and answering, but also consider the visual triggers like the images. So here's an example called Math Flamingo. It's, it's a work from Stanford. They try to build up upon the Flamingo uh, uh, language model, multimodal language model from the DeepMind, and they try to apply it specific to the medical domain. So in this case, uh, it pretty much in, at the end, of the, the end result of this model is pretty much you can give an image to the model and ask specific questions, and then they try to answer you uh, about uh, whether a diagnosis is there and whether certain claim is true or not. And uh, so this kind of model shows improve the visual question answering, uh, understanding performance. And they also evaluated, again, on the UNSLD, LSE uh, questions, uh, sorry for the typo. Uh, but only about on those questions that has the visual supplements. 
and uh, they also have clinician rates uh, to raise the, the, the qualities. And again, this shows that uh, these kind of uh, data sets they have for evaluation is sort of uh, unique to their own papers. And they also have difficulty to release them because of the other concerns, privacy, ethical concerns. So it makes the uh, developing these kind of models in a benchmark in a traditional deep learning way difficult in this control scenario. And more recently, actually, this paper just published uh, this this month. Uh, some they sort of evaluate the GPT four vision, uh, so the the one that released a while back, uh, how they apply on the U.S. Uh, medical licensing exams. That uh, whose questions that have the visual trigger. So previously we saw example is basically just a vignette of patients describing text, but now this time they consider also consider the text with medias like uh, like uh, tables and also images. And it turns out that uh, this GPT-4V performs much better than uh, GPT-3.5 or ChatGPT and GPT-4 and can also generate uh, explanations that are uh, deemed uh, reasonable by health professionals. And also they found that uh, even though it can generate wrong uh, explanations, this can be fixed by giving some extra hint to describe the image. But however, again, we see that um, this, there are different evaluation setup, different questions, dis, despite, despite the fact that they're all sourced from the, from the medical licensing exams. And also they tend to uh, employ different prompting setups. So in a nutshell, it's pretty difficult uh, nowadays to compare these large models to really see uh, which works um, better on what. And the next section, we're going to talk about uh, retrieval augmented generation. So uh, in short, RAG, and uh, it's a kind of a buzzword nowadays, but uh, actually it's, uh, it's kind of a has a lot of promise uh, to, uh, to make a land or generative language model better. And uh, the setup of, of RAG is that uh, uh, instead of only having a language model to generate the output, you sort of have an ex external data store, <laughs> excuse me. And when you try to generate something and uh, you give a language model a query and the, the query become kind of an index and try to query something from the uh, data store to supplement the generation of language models. So in this way, it, it, the kind of the external data store is able to provide up to date and uh, other uh, information that is difficult to update the in the for in the language model in the language model. So because one difficult thing of LM is that it's really costly to train. Once you train it, you just want to keep it fixed. It's really difficult uh, to update it if you have new information. So RAG is one way to uh, abstract that kind of uh, external knowledge from the LM. And when the LM try to uh, are uh, kind of needed, it can just query it directly. So that is kind of the idea of of RAG. And uh, it has been shown that it can be pretty ex uh, effective for knowledge extensive, uh, in intensive um, QA and also for fact checking because the good thing about RAG, it can look into the specific evidence from the data store and extract it for user to exam and examine. And uh, uh, in particular, this RAG can be really relevant to the clinical context because uh, the medical resources such as medical guidelines can be updated continuous, continuously. And it's unimaginable if you have a guideline updated, you just want to train your LM again, that's not feasible. And also there's a lot of new clinical research to keep track on. And uh, also there's an in-house patient records that is difficult to, to, to make it be from the healthcare system. And it is possible to have a set up a rack system that can ask LM to, to retrieve the patient records uh, instead of uh, actually being trained on this. And also it, it has some potential to offer patient specific uh, answers uh, that is stored, uh, can be easily stored in the, in, the, in this case, the data store. So I'm just gonna give one example about how RAG can be uh, applied in the clinical time context. So there's actually very few studies available out there applying RAC to clinical uh, uh, NLP, clinical text. 
And here is just a very recent study about using uh, default uh, GPT-3 as a language model and uh, the OpenAI embedding model as retriever. And uh, this sort of uh, this study from Stanford, uh, they sort of present a new clinical QA data set, try to simulate the clinician's workflow to get uh, questions sourced from clinicians that they, they tend to ask from the data, in the daily work. And then measure uh, sort of focusing on the factuality, completeness, uh, safety, and again, evaluated by human. And uh, the RAC system uh, shows uh, really good results. Oh, sorry, it's not GPT-3, GPT-3.5, which is uh, ChatGPT. So the RAC system compared to their, the system without RAC actually shows much better uh, improvements uh, within these rubrics. And also with the, the retrieval setup, it can enable more control over what can be generated or not generated. And in this case, they sort of set up the measure safety by giving adversarial prompting, for example, to, to, to deliberately ask LM to generate harmful stuff. And um, they sort of having a kind of a, a heuristics to ask the retriever if they did not find any uh, relevant text or similar text from the data store, for example, lower than certain threshold, they will ask the elements to, to stop generation. And in this case, if there's any irrelevant text injected without notice into the patient uh, user query or clinical notes, this kind of retrieval module can stop the element from generating harmful stuff. And uh, so that is just a really uh, like a, a small, like a, like a study using the off-shelf systems. However, there are much more could be done, uh, like changing the different architecture. And uh, there's a lot of variations with RAG in terms of what and when and how to retrieve. And of course, for that uh, 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 study, they didn't use a private uh, patient records at data store. And also there's uh, also other sources like biomedical literature, clinical data, uh, guidelines and other documents. The, um, and also furthermore, there's a lot of tasks that can be uh, done with this RAG systems. Uh, for example, uh, uh, there's a daily routine for clinicians to ask for uh, the specific information about the patient. For example, the, the, the doctors may be taking care of maybe five or 10 patients and he or she cannot remember every detail about the patients. So every time the patients come, the records come, uh, the physician would have a lot of questions about the, the records, uh, patient condition, what has been done, what has been not. And there's a lot of room for doing that kind of uh, question answering uh, 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 over the uh, patient records. And also some potential to find similar patients uh, using the RAC system. So in a nutshell, uh, there's a lot of research to be done in this regard, is the, and it is pretty new in, in, the, in the clinical domain, for the clinical domain. And, and uh, finally, I'm going to talk about some other, uh, briefly, uh, some other implement implementation concerns uh, specific to LLMs. And uh, so one thing is that LLMs have privacy issues. So some studies found that uh, language models can spit out their training data. And you just give this some those prompts or, or some way you can just uh, uh, let it to leak sensitive information, and uh, that's include personal identifi identifiable information, which also related to the PHI that uh, Mike talked about. So there's a techniques available to alleviate, alleviate that, but definitely much more research is needed. And uh, also there's uh, 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 a lot of uh, um, uh, policies or, 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 or regulations need to be done around how these patient texts uh, should be uh, like uh, how how one can use LM to ac access these texts and how these texts uh, should be uh, like uh, curated uh, if it's uh, want to use for the uh, LM purposes. And also there's uh, uh, issues with fairness and biases. This is sort of a general, uh, it's, a it's a kind of a, a challenge for the medical AI in general. And, uh, and these kind of biases can, can be uh, multifacets, they could be demographics, social economic st status, insurance type, and many other aspects. And um, furthermore, the, the biases in medicine can be pretty tricky because we don't want to consider uh, race if we want to say 
uh, uh, consider the cost or consider the expenditure. But sometimes we do want to consider race if we want to give certain medications because uh, different ethnic groups uh, may respond differently to, to, to drugs. It's, for example, the dosage uh, can be, should be different. And um, so in this case, this fairness and biases is, is, is really relevant. And especially for LLMs, they, they have a tendency to, uh, to like, uh, enlarge the biases encoded in the data. So uh, it's pretty, it's critical to consider that in the clinical domain as well. And uh, uh, finally, there's a data shifts issue and the monitoring issue. So data sets shift means that uh, the data distribution sort of systematically changed out of whatever reasons. And uh, then your model, uh, your model, like a machine learning model training your in-domain data, suddenly don't know what to do with the out-of-domain uh, uh, like all the uh, uh, data sets. And uh, that kind of data set shift is really common and prevalent in healthcare. And uh, this can be uh, catastroph really damaging the AI model in terms of its performances. And there's a nice paper uh, kind of reviewing the different data shifts out there in healthcare. For example, they could be changing technology, the terminologies. So the ICD-9, which have an ICD-10, then next time we'll have an ICD-11, so different standards, different practice that can change the data. And also there's a change in population and setting, and uh, that includes a employ, uh, a deployed model to other hospitals, or there's a change in disease incidence, or suddenly you have COVID or have some new disease that would also change the data and, and uh, the model sort of throughout, throughout the model. And there could be also changing behavior. For example, a new kind of reimbursement policy is there. So clinicians try to document things in different ways or certain celebrity was diagnosed with certain disease. Then suddenly a lot of patients want to scan, come to screen for that so, so, uh, that, that disease. So that's also can change the data sets and their opinion and the model and the, 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 the also be uh, the, the data that the model is being applied to. And there are also other clinical practices that can affect LMs, like documentation, documentation practice, uh, clinical uh, clinicians' behavior. Uh, Mike talked about the uh, copy paste. That is uh, can be a pretty big issue with with LMs. And uh, another thing in terms of monitoring, when if when we have this model implemented in real, real, real world, is that. Uh, we're we're not just in like implementing one model. In many cases, we deploy we deploy many models in different worlds, in in different specialties, and they kind of the model outputs will change the underlying data, and uh, and then it's sort of that this data become again later maybe a few days ago becomes an input to this model, and uh, so in this case, there's a temporal change about uh, what's the data the, the actual data around the patients. And the things becomes much messier if you have multiple models try to uh, change the data in different uh, unexpected ways. So this kind of model interact with each other. And I think that this uh, uh, very little study has been done in that regards. And uh, in terms of LLMs, uh, it's kind of, uh, if we, uh, it's, it, if the LLM is implemented in the real world healthcare setting, it's gonna generate text. And uh, in that case, there are also a need to dis distinguish between the synthetic or generated text with the human uh, written text. Uh, otherwise, uh, in, in the, at the end of the day, we may have a, a, cl a clinical database that is uh, uh, polluted with different sources of data that is difficult to monitor. And there are some frameworks to, uh, that people have proposed to uh, do quality insurance uh, about uh, the AI models, but uh, however, as we uh, talked about, the deployment of AI model can be really difficult, and uh, and uh, so uh, so we're still pretty far away in terms of how to do quality uh, improvement or quality assurance in that regards. And the mentioning about uh, distinguishing between human and generated text, uh, if you want to learn more, you can uh, find out um, this Friday afternoon about the. Uh, Alta shared task this year. And uh, so I, I guess that's pretty much me. Yeah, thank you. Questions? Uh, don't forget to introduce yourself. 
Uh, thank you. Outstanding presentation, really. Thank you. Uh, so just to ask you, uh, how difficult it is, sorry, in your judgment or in your experience to build instruction-based fine-tuning for these models? How many trial and errors you have to design effective instructions? How much is the training time you have to kind of absorb in order to be able to design an effective instruction-based fine-tuning for large learning models? I'm sorry, I'm not seeing the Yeah, thanks for that question. I think uh, in regard to instruction tuning, uh, there's the Google paper that we talked about, that we saw earlier. They have a flam palm. That is the flam part is just instruction tuning, and the way they set up instruction tuning, you have different all sorts of data sets and try to tune that with a different kind of tags and different kind of tasks and the way to improve that performances. And uh, I, I think uh, in practice, I guess uh, in, for the cl cl clinical uh, applications uh, is, I don't think there's any work has been done uh, similar to the, the flat work that Google has done. And uh, I think so, so, I think there's a room to collect different uh, sources of uh, clinical data sets like the NER task we, data sets we saw earlier in the Valada's talk and other uh, sort of like classification tasks. And we put it, we can put that together in order to uh, develop and fine tune a large language model. And the other thing is that uh, in terms of uh, how we set up these models, I think there's a lot of a lot of works from the general domain in terms of uh, PEFT or, or parameter efficient fine tuning and that uh, we can use in, in for the general uh, for the clinical domain. And uh, however, I, since there's not much research done to the domain specific instruction fine tuning, I, I, I'm not quite sure like how much, like what kind of extent we, we should expect, like how far we, we could expect this kind of technique to push all our hands to perform better than say that we see the, the, the wild or fully supervised smaller in the models. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, hi, so I'm Keith from Bavia. Um, so I guess um, I have uh, two sort of observations slash, slash questions and then two actual questions. Yep. So number one is um, on, this, on one of the slides you said that we had to train one task per model. So um, I, yeah, so like, I guess I'm just wondering like, why we only train one task per model because um, are you aware of the, and then now triple M L U benchmark measuring masses multiple. Oh yes, yes, yeah. I, I yeah. Yeah, so for example, that's like a typical like multi task yep. like benchmark, right? Yeah. So yeah, I, I agree with that. I think this is not a kind of a uh um so 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 the kind of a loose uh, description down there. It, of course, you can train on multitask models, but the typical, I guess, uh, practice for fine tuning, for example, a bird model is is that so you just focus on specific task. But I totally agree with you. It's possible to train a model on multitask as well, multi different targets. Uh, but actually, from my experience working with clinical techs, is is not E very easy to get the, the improvements when training with multitask. If you have multiple patient labels and just try to uh, wait then doing the uh, fine tuning process, it's not always gonna give you better results. But I guess in this case, uh, the, the one model per task is meant to contrast with the large language model, decoder based model that have uh, general capabilities. Um, so I guess the second sort of idea that I have, so I can see that the right idea actually somewhat ties into the data shift idea because the right idea yeah. is about having some external database, right? And yeah. so I'm just thinking, so RAC has this assumption that you have this intermediary step where you retrieve the data, you put in the database, you vectorize it, and you retrieve the data. So how about instead of doing that, can we do like a Google search? Can we make like a uh, Google API call? Vectorize that data. Yep. And then if we do that right, then we can use the most up to date information and we don't need this intermediary step. Yep. And also, that would solve the data shift problem. Um, so, I'm not exactly so I don't know if you've heard of machine learning. So, I don't know like, how that could integrate with machine learning. Machine learning is the thing that is the data shift. Yep. Right. So, 
Yes, I, I, that's that's a really nice point, and and I think there's a lot of resources, including the the web contents that we can consider as a part of the data store, and I totally agree with this, uh, as this uh, study have shown that uh, they sort of improved the completeness, but they didn't really measure robustness uh, explicitly. But I would guess that uh, this kind of rack system would also help with robustness. But one thing with the data sh data sets shift issue is that uh, it's it's more of focusing on the data within the healthcare systems. For example, how uh, a patient or a physician behaviors change this data, or are the standards change the data, and those are pretty much specific to the healthcare system itself. And uh, so external data sometimes might, might not really have much with the, with the in-house data, but I, I agree that uh, there's a potential that uh, they could be leveraged and different ways to approach this. Yeah. So yeah, so now uh, for the actual two-way question. Yeah. So I guess, um, so, so you mentioned about the true, the true two-shot paper. So yeah. yeah, so I just don't know what that means specifically, like what do you mean by true? True that seems like it is untrue. Yeah, so so the way that, uh, for example, you have a benchmark, you want to apply your large language models, then you want to give us a few prompts uh, to let it uh, uh, and select a few demonstrations. That means few shots to ask it to generate results. However, the selection of these demonstrations can be pretty critical. So even though it's five shots, these five examples can make a much difference compared to those five examples. And uh, there's a tendency that people try to cherry picking some of the examples and the true field uh, framework means that we're only cherry picking. We try to do some cross validation or sort of things to truly measure the, the, the validity and the effectiveness of these LLMs. Yeah, and I guess I have like a question because I'm not too familiar with PQA. So I'm just wondering like with PQA, so so you have like this, so for example, the multimodal PQA you have, right? So you have like this text, this image, and then a question. Yeah. So can we have like so so can we have like a follow-up question? Uh in their setting, I don't think so, but it's possible. I guess it's uh would be really nice to have that kind of interaction and to ask the model to kind of correct uh, its response if there's some missed or incorrect information. But I don't think there's a like existing benchmark for that. Thanks. One more question. Thank you. Uh, so from ECG. Uh, quick question. Uh, the end you mentioned about the unbiased, unbiased the, the models can be. Uh, I've always asked a question. I uh, uh, many questions, but first half. So what is the best way then to solve that? Is it to get more data on the underrepresented population of cohort uh, or demographics or collecting more data that it is more uh, 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 even and then train a new model on that? What, what, what would be the best approach I, to avoid that? Advice? Yeah, I, I think there's uh, definitely a, a definitely there's a way to collect more data, more representative representative data from patients to alleviate this issue. But I think there's also a way to to like uh, uh, like improve your modeling in terms of how do you trade off between fairness and accuracy. And uh, there's actually a lot of active research in that regards and actually the NLP lab here at Unimel, uh, uh doing a lot of great research there. And you can find Leah uh, maybe in during the Alta in these few days if you want to learn more about this, this kind of studies. Thank you for that. Uh, before, let me get, give a round of applause to all of you. <laughs> so the tutorial concludes now, um, but we have an NLP meetup happening right now, starting now. Um, so if, if you don't know what's the NLP meetup, it's just, you know, for the NLP community from both the street and actors, so you get to come in and then go and work at the company. And uh, there's going to be like two talks actually uh, for this NLP meetup. So if you're interested in this NLP space uh, and didn't know about this NLP meetup, uh, just continue to stick around and uh, yeah, enjoy some good talks. Thank you.